evening, everybody, and welcome indeed to this evening's Facebook Live. This is all about economics for teachers and students in second level schools in Ireland, as well as for everybody who is interested in the subject. What I'm going to do here this evening is I am going to uh, delightfully take you through a range of issues that are happening in the Irish economy at the moment. But in particular, what I am going to start off with is whereyourmoneygoes.gov.ie. Just like I did in last month's session, uh, I'm going to take you through a really, in my opinion, a really, really useful um, website that helps you to figure out what is going on in the economy and how to take advantage of the information that is there so that it's, a, so that, 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 that it's useful for you to see and it, that it's useful for you to extrapolate the data from so that it can speed up your revision or your research. Okay, so this is called whereyourmoneygoes.gov.ie and down here there is the full breakdown of what is going on in the economy from the point of view of what your taxes are spent on. So for example, as you can see here, we've got 21 billion for social protection, we've got 18.3 billion for health, education, justice, agriculture, debt servicing and payments and transport. So, as you can see there, there is a, quite an amount of money that is spent in the Irish economy. And up here, as you can see, the total expenditure for 2020 is expected to be 80.4 billion. Now, of course, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through how to look at housing tonight. So, as you can see, it's not down here. So, it's not in social protection or health or any of the others. And it must be there for in other. Now, if you double click on any of these columns, well, then you will see a breakdown of what's going on underneath. So I'm going to double click here. And now you can see 206 million is spent in the Department of the Taoiseach. Uh, 529 million is spent in the Department of Finance, Public Expenditure Reform, Foreign Affairs and so on. And now in here, you can see that I have housing, planning and local government. Now, if I wanted to see what that money is spent on, I double click in here. And, uh, and there I can see if there's a drill down, I can see what's available to me. For example, in here, what's in the Taoiseach, I can see that there's 206 million spent there and, and I can't drill down any further. So over here, as you can see, there's 4.31 billion spent on housing, planning and local government. So what I would say here is that if you are looking to find out something about a government policy on a certain area, or you're trying to see, you know, how much money do we spend every year on, on, uh, on debt servicing or on repaying money upon our debt, that's another chapter in the book. Or of course, uh, how money or the way in which the money is being split across different priorities of the government, maybe for example, it's health and education, etc. You can see that here in this website very, very simply. So as I say, it's something that I find very useful and uh, it's, it's very, very simple to use. So what I'm just going to do here is I'm just going to copy and I'm going to paste here at the, here is the link to the, oh, I'll just do that again. Link to the site, uh, breaking down the Irish government expenditure, expenditure, okay. And there you go, okay. So of course it will be, a, a, a many of the sites that uh, I'm talking about here uh, are all available. I will be giving you the link. And just like I did last time, I will be putting together a comprehensive blog post with all of these links and so on right here on our it'll be available on our blog which is thepositiveeconomist.com and also of course it will be available secondarily it will also be available on the edco blog as well which is positiveeconomics.ie just like last time if you would like a copy of the recording and the links and so on uh, rather than you having to go and look for that that blog post where i'll have all of those together please do send us in a message on messenger and just tell me that you would like to get the, the link sent across to you, okay? So uh, just go on to Messenger, Susan Hayes, the Positive Economist on Messenger. Let us know your email address and uh, we will certainly send it out and make sure that you have it. Okay, so now that we know how much the government spends on something like housing, as we can see here, it's 4.31 billion. Now that is including planning and local government as well, okay? So what we, what we now need to do is just, we need to be considerate of how is housing, how, what is the situation like in Ireland at the moment? Now, in economics, we know that things 
are decided upon, decisions are made within the market economy. So to put that another way is, within economics in the market, we have supply, demand, and then we also have an amount that is supplied, at a, a quantity supplied. And what we do is that we take the quantity supplied and that interacts with how much is demanded. And that is what, that is where we find our price. In other words, what you do is that you look at demand, you look at supply, you look at where they match together and where they match together is on price. So that is where the people who have the money to afford the quantity available in the market pay for it at the price that they can afford. And from there, uh, that is how the pricing structure happens. Now, as a result of that, I thought the best thing to do tonight would be to go through supply. We'll, let's start off, start off there because that's where a lot of people are talking right now. Supply, then we can move into demand and then we can look into price. And then finally, we can finish off by looking at consequences. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close down here where your money goes and I'm going to open up the latest housing report from DAFT. Okay, so DAFT.ie, again, all of these are going to be available. All these resources are going to be available to you afterwards. So you can, of course, get access to these right afterwards uh, on, uh, on the link that I'm going to provide you with. But just, just as I say, send us in a message if you want us to send that through to you. So on the DAFT.ie report here, okay, this is produced... Uh, this was released just a couple of days ago from Ronan Lyons, uh, probably one of the most well-known housing economists in the country. And in particular, what he raised was, he raised an issue that the fact that 70% of new homes sold were in the greater Dublin area, and the average national house price is now €250,766. Uh, in other words, let me put that another way. And that is that the average house price in Ireland is now over a quarter of a million. That is not in Dublin. That is national, okay? That is a national price. So that is taking average of houses sold in Cork and in Limerick and in Leitrim and in Tullamore and in Donegal and in New Ross, right? That is an average national house price in Ireland is now officially over a quarter of a million euro. So what we need to start off by looking at is, so how, like, how many houses are actually available in Ireland today? If I wanted to sell a house today, if I wanted to buy a house today, what is the supply that I'm actually looking at. And what we see is that we have approximately a nine, 69,000 houses, so properties listed for sale during 2019. Now that is significantly higher than 2016 because back then it was 52,000 and dramatically much higher than it was in 2012. In 2012, there was just 33,000 houses. So that means that the housing, number of houses available for sale are up to now 69,000 properties uh, during 2009. So that is, you know, certainly a help when it comes to supply. So we can see that, that there are more. Now, that's not all though, because this could come from people selling their existing houses and looking to buy another one, or which means that there isn't a, there isn't a new net house created. Or what this can also mean is that people are potentially leaving the country or this may potentially mean that people are looking for a different type of house than where they actually are at the moment, or it may, be, may mean that they want to move. So the question is not just how many are available for sale, but how many are actually, how many houses are actually being um, provided or how many houses are being made available. So uh, new and completed. So for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the banking. Okay, Banking Payments Federation of Ireland. And what I'm going to do is I am going to go to the approvals report. And on top of that, BPFI. I, I am also going to go to the housing market monitor. And particularly when I go to the housing market monitor here, I'm going to look for completions. And it's interesting here that... I, if we start again there now, yeah, right here, is that I notice here that the number of, uh, of completions are 5,600 in the last, last quarter, which is a 22% rise on the time before. And similarly, I can also see that 7,600 houses are started, and that was in the last quarter as well. Okay, sorry, Q3, right? So that was, that was in the autumn of the year, which is up 32%. So again, Another similar trend here, 
which is that housing is increasing. The, qu the quality, quantity of them. There are more houses available for sale now than there were. There are more houses being completed now than there were. There are more housing um, being started now than there were. Okay, so all of that, all of that is good. All of that is good from the point of view of expanding the supply. However, it's not enough to just look at that and say, okay, supply is increasing, therefore that's good. Further, what we need to do is that we need to look further than that. And what we need to do is that we need to think about, okay, what do people use houses for? And you might say, oh, come on, Susan, seriously, that's a very simple thing to answer. The answer to that, of course, is that they buy them to live in. Yes, they do. But the thing is that actually they don't just buy to live. They also buy to do what else? People also buy houses with a view to renting them out later on. And I found this statistic very interesting, right? When you actually look at this statistic, let me show you uh, on the... Let me show you, yeah, look at this. Look at this statistic here on the report. Is that rent, the rental market is home to almost one third of all households in the country. Now that was higher than I had anticipated. That was higher than I thought when I started doing my research on this subject. So actually one in three households in the country are home to the rental market. Now you might say that doesn't sound right because we have a lot more people living in houses that are bought. So when you think about all of the, look at the number of children in the country. So people who are children, of course, live in a house that generally is owned, uh, and many of them that live in a house that generally is owned. Or you might say, well, a lot of pensioners, like primarily all the, many of the pensioners in the country live in a house that is typically owned. And you would be right in both cases. You, you would be. However, this doesn't refer to people. This refers to households. So actually one in three households in the country. So if you think about a household, that could be a student living on their own. That could be uh, two people without children who are recently moved in together in Cork. Or that would consist as one household, uh, which and one household, of course, would be the same as two parents with five children. That is also one household. So it's actually not about the number of people. It's the number of households. Now, when we take a look at rent, when we take a look at that, well, then we have to look at another factor, which is if one in three households in the country are renting, what is the supply of houses to rent, not to buy? And from that point of view, that is where we would go and we would go back to the go, look at a different stage in, in this report. And let's take a look for this number, uh, which is not in uh, this one, but... Uh, let me go back here again. Um, sorry, it's the rental report that you should be looking for. And look at this number. Oh. Okay, we'll try it again. There we go. And that is on the 1st of November 2019. There was 3,500 homes available to rent nationwide. Now, let's think about that. Let's think about that. If there are 69,000 houses available for sale and there are only 3,500 homes available to rent, now, there is the difference, is that there is a fraction. There is just a fraction. There is about 6% of the housing stock available to, for sale. Uh, in comparison, 6% of that housing stock is available to rent. And that is the difference, is that there is a much, 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 much lower availability of homes to rent. Now, at the same time, this is up 10% at the same time last year. And here's another interesting statistic. Uh, for you, certainly one that I found interesting anyway. That is that of that number, we are looking at approximately, uh, that is the first, the very first November in a full decade that that has happened. Okay, that is incredible in, in, uh, in, in my opinion. So um, that is the fact that it is the first November in a full decade when the number of rental properties available actually increased. And this is, as I say, this is the issue. Uh, this is where our issue comes from, is actually not just in the number of houses available for sale, but it's also in the number of houses available for rent. And that's not all. It's also when you look at where people want to buy or to rent, that is another issue. Because are the houses being built or are the houses or apartments available for sale or available to rent in the places that we want them to be? That's the other question. And that, a lot of that is driven by employment. Like, where are people working? Are people working in rural Ireland? Well, to a large degree, you know, a lot of people are. But of course, there's an awful lot of people, particularly when it comes to students, when it comes to, uh, to people working in many of the professional services, or when people are simply looking for more plentiful employment opportunities, they are living in cities. 
So that is why we also need to look at what is available to rent or what is available to buy and where. So when I say what, I mean, I'm talking about in the context of if you have got a one bedroom apartment and that one bedroom apartment is available and a family with four children are looking to, to buy, well, then that's going to be a mismatch. Similarly, if you've got a couple who have just moved in together, they're not going to look for a five bedroom house. So that is why we also need to look at, well, what is available for rent and what is available for sale? So I think that down here, it's interesting, the fact that this staff.e snapshot put this together. And what it does here is that it refers to how much um, a one bedroom apartment, let's say, versus a two bed house versus a five bed house is actually available for. So you can see the individual pricings there. Now, um, it's interesting to, to note here that if you want something really expensive, uh, Dublin 4 is the place to go for a two bedroom house to rent on a monthly basis. It is €2,296. And by the way, that is up 2.3% on last year. Uh, similarly, if we want to look at something that has fallen the most in terms of a percentage, is that a five bedroom house in Dublin 1. Now, I don't know where you can find those. Um, I, I, um, I live in Dublin myself, by the way. Uh, and so therefore, and within our business, I tend to be in Dublin city quite a bit. So I do not know where the five bedroom houses are that are in Dublin one. Um, but what I do know is based on this report is that the price, the, the rent price here has fallen by 6.4% down to 3,310 uh, euro. So you can see there exactly what is available, but you know, you know what is actually even more interesting is imagine that you are somebody who is interested in buying a house and you're currently renting. What DAF.ie have done is very interesting report on that. And what they've done is they've actually compared, uh, let me get this for you now, just going to bring this down further. Yes, no, it was going to go further again. Uh, let me go right down here. Uh, let me see, okay. Uh, mortgage. Okay. Yes, here we go. This is what I was looking for, which is that imagine that you are somebody who is living in a certain region and you want instead to consider uh, getting mortgage. And what Daft.e here have compared is what your mortgage would be to your rent, right? And I find this really, really interesting because if you look at current mortgage repayments, okay, so we're just going to, if, if you're interested in, in the particular detail of this, right, you, you can see all of it up here. Um, so, so that's what the assumption is based on. I'm not going to spend time in explaining that because it's, it's ultimately not what you're really going to want to see. But what I, what I do find interesting down here is that if I was to get a mortgage at the moment in Dublin 1 for a one-bedroom apartment, okay, we can see this right here. The mortgage will cost me 871. The rent, on the other hand, is almost double. It's actually doubly expensive to rent in Dublin one in, uh, for a mortgage, in for a one bedroom apartment in comparison to a mortgage. And on the other hand, if I go down here, for example, to Dublin seven, uh, down here you can see uh, to rent in Dublin seven at the moment will cost me 1600 euro. The rent would be 821 euro in that uh, it's more than double. It's actually more than double. But then if we go to a different part of the country, right? Let's go, I'm gonna to go to somewhere in, uh, let me go to Kilkenny. In Kilkenny, the opposite is the case. Or sorry, the, the same is the case, is that the rent in Kilkenny is 702 euro, whereas the mortgage for the same apartment uh, would be 311 euro. Let me go to Mayo. Here's where the mortgage would be 233 euro, where the rent is 545 euro. So therefore, the point is the same, which is that rent is where the issue sits. That's where the real issue sits in Ireland today is because when you look at the amount of properties available for sale, as in the supply of properties available for sale, and you compare that to, to the supply of properties uh, available to rent, this is where our issue is. It comes from two points. One is that there aren't enough of them. And two is that to actually move from rent to mortgage uh, is a very, very, very big jump. It, it's far easier to actually repay a mortgage than to pay rent. The problem is, of course, is how do you get the deposit together if you're renting in order to get the mortgage? And that's your issue. So if you need, for example, I'm going to say a deposit of 50,000 euros, or, um, or you need a deposit of 80,000 euros, or you need a deposit of 120,000 euros, very, very difficult to get that together when at the same time you're paying rent, which is double your mortgage. So therefore, this is ultimately where our supply issue, issue arises from. So, uh, of course, 
when you are answering a question in Leaving Cert, you're not just asked about the state of play, which is what I've taken you through, and I've also taken you through um, where to find the information, which is from a couple of different places here. It's the daft.ie uh, uh, housing report from the point of view of sale, selling houses and also from the point of renting houses. But the other issue is, um, is okay, how do we get over this, right? So, so what, can we, what can we put forward uh, as a suggestion when it comes to housing? Well, there are, of course, a range of them, and a number of them have been, have been put forward by a range of economists. And uh, that is that we could do, we could simply incentivize people to build more houses, okay? So we could put, um, we could put some processes in place so that the builders and developers are given incentives so that they can build more houses. We have discussed the idea of dropping the VAT rate on houses. So then that might make them, that might make them more, well, that would make them less expensive, at least in the short term. Uh, also, we've, we have, there's a range of people talk about producing modular housing. So that would be smaller housing. So if you're going to take up a space like where a five bedroom house might happen is to actually, is to renovate or to build similar housing like that. But rather than produce five bedrooms in the one house, uh, what we would do instead is that we would take that, that type of house and we would split it into five different five different apartments or five different houses or something of that nature. Um, the other point as well that has been put forward is, could we put a rent freeze? So could we stop rent going up? So that won't change the supply of rental properties. It won't change the three and a half thousand. It won't turn three and a half thousand rental properties into 7,000 rental properties. But what it would do is that it would cap the price of rent, which then would give people the space to be able to at least save some money so that they could move towards getting a deposit. And then, of course, there's also the idea around uh, disincentivizing leaving homes empty. In other words, if you're going to have a house that's empty, maybe you're somebody that has built a house and you haven't got around, gotten around to renting it out or selling it. Maybe it is that you've inherited a property and you haven't gotten around to selling it or renting it out. Is that then you should have to pay a fine. And then that fine would incentivize more of the existing housing stock that isn't made available for rent or for sale to be made available for rent or for sale. All of those are very, very well discussed, and and there's been a lot of people. Uh, a, a lot of people came on, um, a lot of people have come on various different me news and media sources to talk about this and to talk about the veracity of it, and to talk about how it might be the case and a variety of different things like that. But can I add one other thing into the mix, right? Can I just add another point? And this sounds like it's going off. It, it sounds like that it's, it's going off. You know, off off topic, but it's not. And that is that, how about we make the places whereby it is cheaper to buy or where there are more plentiful houses or properties to rent, how about we make those places more attractive? And how and we can, right? And there's lots and lots and lots of people are doing this. Lots of people, for example, are moving, you know, from Dublin to Kilkenny or from Dublin to Mayo or from Dublin to Cork, from Dublin to Donegal. They are moving out of these centers. Uh, and that is where they're finding that there is more, you know, that a cheaper house is available and uh, that there may be more properties to rent or to buy. But of course, in order to do that, you have to be considerate of what do people need accordingly? Well, what they need are opportunities. And what they need are opportunities to do great jobs or very well-paid jobs in these particular regions. So again, to give you an example, one of the most important projects in the country is broadband. Like when I'm, I'm, I'm from Cork originally. Uh, I love to go down and visit my mom and dad. And uh, and on occasion, I have on several occasions, in fact, I have been in Cork when I needed to have a call with a customer in the US, or I needed to have, let's say, I needed to have calls with my staff who are who are dotted around the world, and various different things like that. So if I don't have broadband, well, then that means that I can't conduct those calls now. As I say, I live in Dublin, that is where our office is, that's where I live. But if we were thinking of moving to Cork, I simply couldn't run our business the way it's run at the moment without very, very, very serious broadband. If I have to drive, let's say 20 miles into Cork City to book out a meeting room so that I can have calls, then that simply is not going to be possible. So one of the key things there is all around the issue to do with na the National Broadband Plan. That is absolutely pivotal. The second thing is I'm talking about running a business where you can work from home or where you can work remotely. 
And a lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people want to drive to an office or cycle to an office or walk to an office. And, and how do we find, you know, global jobs outside of the main, of the main urban areas? And this comes back to the work of the IDA. And the IDA is the Industrial Development Authority, and they are tasked with running uh, our foreign direct investment program. And what they do is that they seek to bring uh, companies into, uh, into different parts of the country, right? So for example, when you look at Intel has a huge, huge campus in Kildare. You look at Medtronic, huge campus in Galway. You look at most of the countries pharmaceuticals are based in Ring of Skiddy and Cork. You can go a, a variety, a variety of them, uh, are right around are right around the country. And what's really important is that the IDA continue to bring jobs, uh, high performing, high quality jobs to different parts of the country. And you can see at the moment, two thirds of all of their, um, of, of their efforts or their outputs are being delivered into rural Ireland. And that is absolutely key and pivotal. And then the third thing is to promote rural Irish enterprise. And this is where companies, small businesses like my own, can get started in different parts of the country and are supported to be able to facilitate bringing business right around the country and also to create rural jobs as well. And there are a range of, of, uh, of incentives in place for this. There are the local enterprise offices that take place. Um, there's a local enterprise office in every county in the country. In some cases, there's more than one. And also, there are a variety of uh, incentive programs as well, like Back for Business, which is helping people who have returned from working abroad to get started in business, or the Acorns program, which specifically is a um, uh, an initiative related to women in business in rural Ireland, uh, so that they also can be given extra uh, opportunities and supports to keep and to build those those jobs in rural Ireland. And that is the way in which we can actually truly not just expand the supply but how we can actually level out the supply as well. Now, at this point, I just want to uh, just want to make uh, a point here that uh, I've got a couple of messages in on Messenger, people asking me to send the recording to them and the presentation to them with the various different elements of what I'm going to be discussing. Uh, absolutely, no problem at all. Um, just want to say hello to Siobhan. Thanks, Siobhan O'Sullivan, uh, for, for your comment. Um, and also, there's a couple of other teachers. I think that they're teachers. They may be students as well, of course, who are just sending me a message in saying, can I make sure to send the details? Then absolutely, I'm more than happy to do that. And of course, I also want to make the point that if you leave your email address there, we will send the link to you and also let you know when the next uh, the next monthly Facebook Live is going to be coming up. Now, let's move on from there then. Uh, let's move forward and let's instead look at demand. Okay, so what is actually driving the demand of housing? We need to also be considerate of that because what is driving the demand is going to be what we need to think about and what we as economists uh, can actually do regarding uh, increasing our, our, let's say, meeting the demand where it's actually being demanded itself. Now, first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is mortgage approvals, right? When we look at mortgage approvals right here, what you can see now is the amount of money that is being approved in mortgages that will ultimately find its way into the economy. So this is the first indicator of demand. Now, over here, what I can see is the latest data that I have is from November 2019. And in here, you can see that we have a, a total in November of 4,102 4, mortgages, 4,102 mortgages. And that was in November. So that was in the month. And that comes to almost a billion euro. So a billion euro uh, in terms of value, um, that is how much money is waiting to hit the Irish economy in terms of housing. So there's a billion euro that has been uh, approved. Now, the way in which the mortgage process works is that you apply for your mortgage, okay? And you apply for your mortgage on the basis of your earnings and of your deposit. So if you have 100,000 euros of deposit, let's say that you're making 50,000 euros in your wages, uh, the rules at the moment are approximately that you can apply for three and a half times your salary. So therefore, you might be applying for, let's work that out, calculator. So if I'm earning 50,000 euros, and I multiply that by 3.5 times, I can apply for a mortgage of 175,000. 
And if I add on my uh, a deposit of 100,000 on top of that, that means that I would have 275,000 euro to spend on a house. Now, uh, in order to have the 100,000, I would need to have that saved in the first place, which is a big ask. And of course, secondly, for you to be earning 50,000 euro is also well above the average wage, the average industrial wage today in Ireland. So you would need the two together. And at that stage, a single person uh, would be able to afford. Remember what I told you that the average house price is in Ireland today? The average national house price in Ireland today is actually a little bit over a quarter of a million. So this would make this person, this person uh, may be able to then afford uh, a house as per the normal, uh, sorry, as, a per, uh, as per the average rate today. Now, you, that's a very high rate though. And, and this is the point is that, that that is a very high rate at the moment. So it's a very high price at the moment. So, but if they're approved, that doesn't mean they get the money. That's not the way it works. If you're approved, you only get the money if you actually get the house. So after you get approved, then you have to buy the house and you have to get agreement in the house. Then there has to be an order accepted on the house and then the money is drawn down. But what about if the person is selling their house first? Well, then they take a risk because if they have to sell their house first, then how do they know that they're going to get the right amount of money approved for the mortgage? And then how do they know that they're going to actually get the house that they put the offer in? So what I'm just saying is that this means that if there's 960 million that has been approved, that's not to say that 960 million is ready to be spent. That's not 960 million sitting in Irish bank accounts around the country waiting to be spent. That has been that it's just been approved. These people, these 4,102 mortgages, then have to go and find suitable houses. And again, remember, that if they, if they are looking for a house in Ireland, so 4,102 mortgages, and there are approximately uh, 69,000 houses available for sale, okay? So then, just like I mentioned earlier, can they find the house that they want in the area that they want? And secondly, can they find not just the houses that they want, but at a price that they can afford in an area that they want? Uh, I've just had another message in here on Messenger. Uh, somebody else here has just sent in a message saying, can I send you the link? Uh, afterwards with all of the information absolutely i will but please do leave your email address in there please even if you're i'm of course recording this live but if if it's not live if you're not watching this live and you're watching the recording of this please do send us in a message into uh into messenger on susan hayes the positive economist and we will make sure that this gets sent right out to you afterwards okay so the first element of demand is mortgages that is one absolute key area uh, right up, uh, right away, there's no doubt about it, is the amount of money that is being approved is one key element of demand. The second thing is where are people working, right? And that is where we would look. Do you remember I showed you this last time? I showed you this, the DBEI dashboard the last time. So that's the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation. And what I want to do is I want to show you the regional unemployment rates. This will tell you where the job opportunities are because in terms of regional uh, unemployment, what you can see here is where people are unemployed. Where is the most likely place the people are to be unemployed? And then the converse of this is that the lower the unemployment rate, the higher the employment rate, okay? Now, let's go through this and let's really figure out what this means. First of all, over here in Dublin, we have 4.5% uh, of, of an unemployment rate, okay? So 4.5% of people who are available for work uh, are unemployed in Dublin. If we go down here, to Cork, uh, Cork, Kerry, uh, Limerick, we are looking here 5.1%, okay? So unemployment here is higher. Slightly higher again is the border up here at 5.4%. So all of the border region will be Donegal, uh, Sligo, in here into Leitrim. So all, all of these, these areas over here, okay? But the highest unemployment rate is actually down here in the Southeast. It's 7.3%. The highest rate of unemployment in the country is down here in the southeast at 7.3 percent the lowest rate of unemployment is 4.5 percent now these figures here i want you to be careful with these okay when you see that the unemployment rate in mid east is 6.1 percent um i'm sure many of you would agree that there's a lot of people in need and in wicklow commuting into dublin so therefore those while they would be living in the middle in the mid east while they would be living there uh, their jobs would actually be in dublin itself so therefore, that figure is, is slightly skewed. So that unemployment rate um, would not just consist of people working in the area, but also people living in the area who are working in Dublin. So therefore, we can also see here that the more employment there is, 
the more employment opportunities there is uh, or there are, well, then the more likely it is that people will be demanding uh, properties there. For example, it's very likely that Dublin and the Southwest here, um, the Midwest, uh, all of those areas have got unemployment either and, and the West of Ireland over here, all at places of uh, unemployment of 5% or lower. Now, when you look here at the Mideast, when you look at the Midlands, uh, when you look at the border, all of those are less likely to have, uh, their, their, there's a higher rate of employment there, unemployment there, and then finally in the Southeast as well. Now, the converse of this then is, if I was somebody interested in foreign direct investment, let's say that I'm a massive company in America, let's say that I'm an Asian company of middle size, and I would like to find a European base. Therefore, I know that if I go to the IDA, the Industrial Development Authority, they will help me to source people and uh, space, rental, property, um, equipment, possibly grants. I may, of course, they've been spoken about before, as I may be able to get tax breaks if I am outside here in rural Ireland. So from that point of view is that the unemployment rate here offers an opportunity then for foreign direct investment or for other rural enterprise uh, for enterprises of a different sort, whether they might be corporate businesses or small businesses or startups. Now, we, of course, by looking over here, you can see that there are, uh, there are more people available for work, for work in, in that case. So therefore, what we know is that the higher the employment rate, well, then we know that if, people, if there are more people employed, there are more people likely to be looking for property, uh, to live from the point of view of renter to buy, or the alternative is, is of course, the more people that are, who are in employment and paid employment, the more likely it is that they have got higher wages and thus the more likely it is that they'll be able to pay higher prices because they will either be able to have more money to put into rent or they will have higher salaries of where you can apply a multiple to get a higher mortgage. Okay, so that is that is the other issue driving demand. Now, uh, if we move on from there, then the other thing that I just want to talk about is the consequence, right? So what is the consequence ultimately of what you see in front of you? So if we know that there are, there are housing units available, okay? So we know there are 69,000 housing units available. Uh, and we also know that there are only 3,500 properties available for rent. Um, and by the way, there's 1,500 in Dublin. Both the number of properties available to rent uh, nationally and in Dublin over the past year has increased by 10%. But they're still very, 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 very small. So what is the consequence of this, right? And the consequence of this, we have to look at from two, well, Two points of view. If I've more time left at the end of that, well, then I will I will elaborate further. But there's two key areas that that matters as a result of this. Number one is price. Okay, that is the first thing. And what we need to do is let's look at the price. So I told you the average house price is two hundred and fifty thousand. Average house price in Ireland today just over a million euro. Okay, we know that. However, if we look at not just that, okay, let's not just look at that. Let's look at the whole country. Let's look at what happened in the country over the past year. Is that with the increasing uh, number of the increasing? Um, let me go further again. Now here we go. This is what I took about. Uh, when we look at the actual asking prices in the country, what we can see is that a lot of them have fallen. An awful lot of them have fallen. Look there at Wexford has fallen by two point nine percent. Kilkenny fallen by five point two percent. House in Carlow fallen by four percent. House in Leash dropped by 1.9%. House in Cork down by 0.8%. So as you can see, a lot of houses here. The prices of a lot of houses has actually fallen. Now, some have risen. So we can see here, uh, for example, I can see that in, uh, in Kerry that it's up slightly. I see in Clare that it's up slightly. I can see, go up here further. Um, Mayo is down by 5%. That's very significant. Sligo, um, Sligo has become a more popular uh, place from the point of view of, of buying. The price has gone up uh, by 2.4%. Now, Leitrim is actually the least expensive place in the country to buy a house right now at €125,000. Uh, that, that is the least expensive part of the country to buy in. Okay. And then if we scroll on down here, you can also see in Dublin, uh, in all areas, all areas of Dublin, you can see the price has fallen, right? It's fallen by 0.3% in North County. Now this, this extends all the way from uh, the north of the city, right up here into Malahide, right up here into the airport area, right up there into the commuter belt, uh, where the commuter belt in, into Dublin. And of course, the DART has been hugely helpful in enabling people 
to uh, to get to get to have transport right into into the city. Now, when you look at South County Dublin, that's down by four percent. That is very significant. It's down by four percent. So the um and but then again, the average house price there is over half a million euro, five hundred and sixty six thousand. So you can see here that we have seen in the increase of the supply of units of housing in Ireland right across the board. Uh, except for some counties like Kerry and like Clare and like Sligo, uh, what we can see is that the actual prices of housing is falling, right? So that's one consequence. So what does that mean? Well, it means a couple of things. Number one, it will give people more opportunities to buy at a lower level. So we, we also know that the wages in Ireland are rising. Um, and I can, I can tell you that, I, I can tell you that quite simply. Down here, uh, down here in real, the real earnings, I can tell you that people in Ireland, uh, when we go back since 2001, uh, people in Ireland are earning more than that dipped down, uh, right throughout the recession, and now it's it's picking picking up again. And of course, just like I said on, on last month's uh, Facebook Live, oh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, oh, let me go forward. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's not to say that everybody every, everybody is earning more. Of course, a lot of the, a lot of what I'm talking about here are averages. But the point I'm making here is that, um, no, it's just taking, sometimes this can be slow. There's an awful lot of data behind this, okay? So I'm ju just, just gonna let it, let it take its time there and just catch up. Um, what I'm saying here is that the average wage, the average wage is increasing in Ireland. That's average, that's not everybody's, that is the average wage. So I can see here that since I know that the amount of money that people are earning is increasing, and if we know that house prices are falling, it now means that people may be able to afford um, a more uh, a house that is closer to what they want, which narrows the gap between demand and supply. So if the amount that people are earning is going up, it means that they would have more money uh, to which they can base a mortgage off or more money to spend on rent. Um, and if, well, let's leave rent out of it for a moment. But specifically when we're referring to um, being able to buy a house, we do know that the gap here is, is narrowing slightly but it's still very high. I mean, to be able to say that the national average is quarter of a million is, is still very, very, very high, still very high. So there is, there is, you know, some work there to be done. Now, let's now go back and retrace our steps, but this time what I want to do is I want to take it through the rental sector, okay? Let me now take it through the rental sector. Go down here, look at this now, right? This is, this is, this is an incredible figure. Look at all of this, right? Every, Every single number that you see there, every single one has gone up. Every single area of which you would rent in Ireland in the past year has gone up, right? Every single one. And this is what's really difficult. Look at this. In Watford, it's gone up by 11%. Now, you think about students who are studying in Watford. Uh, rent there has gone up by 11%. In Clare, they've gone up by 11%. Mayo, 8%. In uh, Carlo, 7%. Westmeath, 7%. Leitrim, 6%. It's the cheapest place in Ireland to buy a house. And yet at the same time, the rent there is 616 euros per month and has gone up 6.8%. Monaghan, up by 6.9%. Louth, up by 3.6%. If we look at Dublin, let me just scroll on down here. If we look at Dublin, every one of them gone up again. 1,700 euro to rent. Uh, in North County Dublin, 1,900 to rent in North Inner City. Uh, South City, 2,100 euro to rent. South County, 2,224 euros per month to rent. All of these, as you can see, has gone up. And here, here, ladies and gentlemen, here is exactly where you see the issue, is that the price is going up because the volume is simply not there. The supply is not there. Despite the fact that you have people who are increasing their earnings, the supply isn't there, which is driving the prices higher. So back to my Leaving Cert students again here. Um, those of you in, in fifth year may not be aware of this yet, but depending on where you're at in, in, your, in your syllabus, if you've covered, uh, if you've completely covered supply, you will. But if not, you won't. And that is that. When you look at supply, if the amount of supply is fixed and the amount of demand is rising, it's rising because you have got people who are earning more and you've got more people who are moving to cities, you've got higher employment, if you're increasing demand, the only way for prices to go is up. The only way for prices to go is up. The only way. And this is what you're seeing. And then you might say, but you know, isn't it crazy that rents are actually higher than mortgage? Yes, it is. But that's, you see, this is what happens is that if, 
In order to move from rent to mortgage, you need to have a deposit. Unless your parents are helping you or unless you're inheriting an amount of money, if you are spending a lot of your money on rent, well, then how are you supposed to save? And therefore, that keeps people in that same cycle of where then they're spending more and more money on rent or else they're moving further and further outside of the city, which increases, increases commuter times, or they're moving into different parts of the country where they are possibly are getting lower level jobs and spend, spending less money on rent, but it's still taking time to move across. And that, that is the economic issue of our time. By the way, this is precisely what's going to dominate also the issue relating to and um, also relating to the election. Uh, I know uh, I, I've, I was re I've been reading a lot around what people are asking about the election. Uh, so what issues are coming up? And number one in, in you know, it, it varies depending on the demographic and so on, but the two top issues in Ireland today are housing and health. And, uh, and how this is, now you know why, right? So now it is because the price of a house is, is, is high. Uh, and secondly, it's because of the amount of rental supply and the direction of inflation in rent as well. One last thing, of course, I cannot do a session on housing uh, and not include one other area. And what I also want to talk to you about is um, back. Oh, let me get it for you now. Oh, it is the homeless figures. I just want to get this now. I had I thought I had this uh, for you. Yes, uh, homelessness. There we go. And um, I just want to show you this homeless report from 29. Yes, this is what I want to show you. Uh, and this is the homeless report. Now, the number, the total number of homeless adults uh, in Ireland today is 6,696. Uh, now, when you look at the split here, it's um, there's more males than females, broadly the split. And here you can see that a lot, the bulk of people are between 25 to 44. Uh, and as you can see, there's 165 people in Ireland today who are homeless. Um, now, it's important to mention that these figures include all three different, all three types of homelessness. So this was private emergency. So this can hotels, B&Bs, et cetera. Then there's also supported temporary accommodation. So this would be um, uh, accommodation, including hostels uh, with on-site professional support. So, and they, this, by the way, a hostel, of course, just for those of you who may not be familiar, would be not where you would have a, a room on your own. This would be where you would be sharing a room, but there would be professional support. So that is SEA. And then also you have TEA. Uh, TEA is temporary emergency accommodation. So this is where people would uh, be in a temporary accommodation or in, in a hostel and may have to leave it the next morning and then wait to see if they have a place there again on that particular night. Um, uh, so the further down the line here you go, the less the less support that there is. Then there's also other, uh, which is, is 16. But also, of course, it's um, it, it's important to also mention that that uh, the, that's that's not all uh, in that we also have children um a number of children in in homeless uh, who are homeless as well so uh when and that is uh, 3752 children are also uh homeless but when you look at where um the vast bulk of course is dublin now does it surprise you does it surprise you that it's dublin well of course not because that is where the highest rents are that is where the highest house prices are um, and that is where the most people are. So as you can see then, as we go outside, there's seven people who are homeless in Longford, three people in Cavan. So they're the smaller numbers, three people in Leitrim. And then of course, if you go to Cork, go to Kerry um, in the Southwest, if you go to the other cities like uh, Galway, there's 326 people that are homeless. And let's find Limerick is, uh, where's Limerick? Limerick's over here, 290 in the Midwest. And this is the other consequence. The other consequence is that if, if rent uh, is too high and if house prices are ultimately too high, well, then that means uh, that you are facing an issue um, whereby it simply becomes unattainable. And, and yes, there are supports in the middle. You know, there's a rent supplement scheme and there's, there's a variety of, of things. There's a variety of, of things that are in between, you know, just where it helps people to stay in their homes, uh, and this could be from getting a holiday from the mortgage, which gives breathing room while they're paying the mortgage. Um, this, as I mentioned, there's a there's rent supplements. Uh, there's a variety of other things there. But in this in this group of people here, and uh, there's that's simply not that's simply not feasible. It's not enough, and therefore uh, they go on the homeless list. And this this is the this is the other consequence of of housing. Now I could talk about other consequences, but um, when supply and demand don't match then you have got prices that are very difficult 
So we've, we've seen the imp Im impact of that or else you simply have people who are not available, who are not able to avail of supply. And that is the figure that, that you're looking at right here. And it's all of these issues, as I say, um, all of these sub issues that I have now got into detail with, with you. That is where, that is where the, the issue uh, stems from. Um, there are a number of other elements I haven't had time to refer to, like you know, the growing population in Ireland um, and, and a number of other things like that that I simply haven't had time to elaborate on. But uh, you can certainly talk to your teachers about that. Uh, uh, the other areas that are, that are making, that are pushing demand or that are influencing demand and supply. Before I finish, because I've got six more minutes left, uh, at this stage, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask if anybody has any questions about anything to do with this area or others, please do, you know, pop your comments in or, of course, send them into Messenger if you want as well. I, I can see my Messenger. It's, it's open here beside me. So I can certainly, I can certainly see that. I can see a range, of, a range of you who have sent messages in there for me to send items on to you. So, so that's, that's, of course, completely fine. Please, please, please do. I'm very happy to, very happy to, to look at that and to be able to, to respond to you. Um, without a doubt, of course. So uh, just while I, while I am here, just as I say, I've, I've only got, got a couple of, of minutes left here. So please do feel free to, to pop whatever it might be in there and, uh, and let me know if there is something that you would like for me to, uh, to answer. But I did also mention that, um, I did also mention that I was going to be talking to you this evening about a uh, revision uh, revision techniques as well so i just just want to give you a very brief outline of what uh are ways in which that you could look at different different points from the point of view of revision so i'm going to just start off uh, i'm going to just suggest to you that you open up your powerpoint okay okay so just just gonna uh just gonna suggest that that you do that right now in here i'm gonna just going to open up here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to open a blank slide. Okay. What I'm going to suggest in here is that you look at smart art. Okay. So I'm going to say, for example, I am going to put here. Uh, right. So here is some smart art. Now, what I find really useful from the point of view of helping revision is examining how you visualize your key points. So for example here, I might say uh, key demand drivers in housing, okay? Now, when I think of this, right, I'm just going to go back here. I'm going to go back here to my smart art design. And what I'm going to put in here is I am going to structure this according take a look around here right and let's just look at the visuals let's let's just think here that actually just because to prove to you that we are live that is actually probably one of the politicians uh, who's canvassing in the area to talk very much about housing <laughs> so if you heard the doorbell that's probably what it is um of course i'm staying here with you so i won't be answering the door uh but as i'm taking a look around here see all of these various different visuals that i could use to help me consider how I might structure my thought process around housing. Okay, and here's one. So it could be around uh, earnings, right? So I know that earnings and I know that um, mortgage approvals, mortgage approvals are two things that drive uh, housing, right? Demand for housing. And within, earn within earnings, I know that uh, what's driving earnings here would be um, growth in average earnings, average earnings, and I also know that uh, growth in employment. So I know that if there's more people employed, it's likely that they're going to have more money. And I also know that if people are earning more, they're going to have more. In terms of mortgage approvals, I uh, know that this is going to um, going to come from mortgage mortgage approval value. And I also know that this is driven by mortgage approval volume. So the more mortgages that are approved, well, then the more money that's going to be available. Uh, and also I know that the higher the mortgage that people are applying for, the more money that's going to be available. So my point is, is that, you know, sometimes rather than just writing down loads of bullet points or looking at paragraphs, etc., what can actually be a good idea is to structure them in visuals. So what I use myself, I use this all the time, is home 
insert smart art and down here then it could be let's say a relationship right so it could be in this case i might choose something else and i might say okay uh i might say here interest rates okay so if if interest rates change the lower the if if interest if interest rates comes down well then uh, more mortgages uh demanded and then up here i could have if interest rates go up fewer mortgages mortgages demanded okay so from this point of view what you can say what you can see here is that i can also use this to just to structure my notes and as you, you saw me there i did really really quickly but you know what else it does is that when you think about this right when you actually go okay insert then you're going to put in smart art and you think um process okay i'm going to think about the process here and the process might be let's say uh wages go up okay so what happens next well then mortgage mortgage value mortgage approval approval things go up okay so what happens after that well then probably house prices go up because people can spend more money you see is that when you actually think through logic like this when you think about okay how do i structure my notes it really makes you think through exactly how um how these these notes would actually work together so that's that's what i find very very good um and another thing that i would say is that it's very good to record your notes the reason for that is that if you are somebody who is an audio learner, it can be a very good idea to record your notes. And if you record your notes, then you can listen to your notes while you're brushing your teeth or while you're walking to the bus or while you're sitting on, you know, sitting on the dart going to school. It's just, it's free study time. So here's how you can do it, right? I use a, a product called Audacity. Okay there is audacity. So let's say that I'm going to record my notes. Now I'm going to say, um, hello everybody. This is me recording my notes right now. Okay. So let's say that I record, let's say that I, I just read out my notes and I record them here on audacity. So you can download audacity for free. Very, very simple uh, product file, save as, or export as export as an MP3. And then you can simply upload it to your MP3 player and listen to your notes. I did that all the time i have to say i did it all the time when i was studying for in the latter stages when i learned that actually i could study using time that i wasn't using for anything else to say i don't need to look at the mirror in order to brush my teeth i know where they are <laughs> so um so i used to listen to my notes anytime that i didn't need to be focused on something i used to listen to my notes and i used to just get free study time uh, and then the third thing that i'm going to say as i wrap this up um i'm not going to say that the third thing that I'm going to say as I, as I wrap this up is when you're revising, okay, because I know that you're coming up to, to mocks in a, in a couple of weeks time. When you're revising, it's really, really, really important to write down every single day what you're comfortable with, right? If today you've gotten a lot more comfortable with supply and demand, uh, then write it down. Have a diary at the bottom of your homework diary, or maybe it's a notebook or something. Every single day, it's so important that you write down what you're actually, or what you're comfortable with or what you're more so comfortable with. The reason for that is purely psychological. And that is that it's so good, it's so much better if you are able to say that you are, um, that, that you've achieved something. If you say, okay, as a result of the discussion that we've had today, we now know since there's such a low supply of rental properties, and since there is such a number of people who are in high paid employment, or just in employment, or the fact that wages are rising, I now know, I now know that is the reason why prices of rents are going up. And I also know the prices of rents went up in every single county and every single part of Dublin last year. If that's solely what you got from this evening, write it down. And the reason for that is that on the day that you feel like, oh my God, I'm getting nowhere in my revision, then you can look back to that and say, no, actually, no, I learned that. And I learned that. And I learned that. And I learned that. And I learned that. Oh, actually, you know what? Maybe I'm not so far behind after all. And it'll just give you the motivation to keep going. So on that note, I'm going to stop. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I'm going to absolutely thank you all so much indeed for joining us this evening. Really glad that, that you could be here. Um, and we're you know more than happy to, uh, to be able to send everybody the link afterwards. Please do put your email address into Messenger so that we can add you to the list and let you know when the next one is on and to be able to send you 
the details of what I discussed this evening. That's what I'm here for. The next one will be taking place next month, uh, next February, and we will be discussing uh, what that is. By the way, the topic is going to be on exports and balance of payments. Huge part of the Leaving Cert syllabus. Uh, obviously, a very big part of the book, since it's a big part of the syllabus. The book, of course, being Positive Economics. So next month is going to focus all around exports, what's driving them. Uh, so we'll be talking a little bit about foreign exchange, balance of payments, as I mentioned, uh, the relationships, the trade relationships that we have with other countries and so on. All of that is going to be taking place next month. And of course, there will be an event up on Facebook by this evening in order to let you know when that is happening. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much indeed. Please do place any comments that you want, either in comments or messenger, and I will certainly get back to you. And thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you. Bye.